He'd go into my room, stand in the closet, and later I'd come in and start studying at my desk, and he could be there for maybe half an hour, and then push open the closet door. These are the chilling words of Russell Williams' former roommate. Russell's fellow students at the University of Toronto remember him as obsessive, always keeping his own room spotless, and folding his laundry with eerie precision. Picking locks, hiding in the dark and precision were key components in the crimes that Russell would go on to commit. In his profession, he commanded Canada's largest military air base. In his spare time, he broke into people's houses on more than 80 counts. At the University of Toronto, he was thought of as shy, but also as a prankster. His crimes, however, point to a much more complex and frightening pathology. By analyzing Russell's word choices in the interrogation, we're able to get an insight into his mind. Likewise, we're able to specify the detective's linguistic strategies to get Russell to confess. An interrogation follows a fixed structure. The first phase about getting the subject to feel comfortable and acknowledged, so that hopefully he'll reveal what he did on his own initiative. Alright. You just have a seat here, Russell. The guy I was speaking with on whatever night that was was Russ as well. Oh yeah. And he took uh, took every number I had. Yeah, now they were uh, doing some pretty thorough interviews that night. So. Yeah, absolutely. It was All good. Right. Glad to see you. I'm just going to move your gloves here. That's a little microphone, just to make sure there's nice and clear. Um, as you can see here, everything in this room is uh, videotaped and audio taped. Check. Uh, have you ever been interviewed by the police in a, in a room like this before? Or? I have never been interviewed like this. Oh, no? Okay. Russell starts out with a playful attitude. His mood's about to change drastically as the detective's questions become increasingly personal. We should pay attention to Russell's accommodating behavior being friendly with the detective, Jim. This is a pattern in Russell's behavior. Friendliness or politeness in a stressful situation where the subject's under suspicion is always noted by the detective, not as a proof of guilt, but as a red flag. Frequently, politeness is an indicator of guilty knowledge when the subject thinks he can win the detective's favor by acting this way. Closest to interview by NIS for top secret clearance. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, again, Russell, I appreciate you coming in uh, an investigation like this. I mean, I'm sure you can appreciate it. it's been big news, uh, especially yeah. down uh, Belleville Way. Um, and, you know, obviously, our approach to cases like this is that uh, uh, we don't give up on somebody being alive until mm-hmm. we get evidence that they're not. So, um, because of that, we're treating uh, Jessica's case uh, as an emergent situation, Absolutely. obviously. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're fast-forwarding things that we might normally take our time with, mm-hmm. um, and that's why uh, we're here on a Sunday afternoon. Sure. So, uh, again, I appreciate it. Okay. Um, we're going to do a pretty thorough interview today, okay? okay. Um, and the reason for that is because uh, the last thing we want is to be calling people back again and again and again, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go over a number of things, and uh, I'm going to explain what all those are to you, okay? okay? Um, I'm a big coffee guy. I don't know if you're a, a coffee guy or not, I, but I didn't want to drink yeah. in front of you, so... No, I appreciate um, that. All right, go ahead. I could uh, definitely... Are they black? Yeah, they're just black with uh, with sugar. Um, definitely, uh, Started your what, sorry? Gum. Just oh, okay. a piece, a piece of gum. <laughs> well, there's napkins there if you want to toss it or whatever. I appreciate that. All right. And again, um, like I said, this interview is going to be very thorough. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, uh, I have a simple rule when I talk to people. It's uh, I'm sure you're the same way. I, I treat pe- everybody with respect. I don't mm-hmm. want to ask you to do the same for me. Um, Later on, Jim repeats this exact information about respect. This is a disarming technique. Letting the subject know or getting the subject to think that he's respected. Psychologically, positive affirmations matter to most subjects, especially in a situation where they're in a submissive role. On another note, this is Jim's indirect way of saying that he's the one who defines this respect and hence its boundaries. It provides the detective with the possibility to refer back to the point about respect later on if the detective deems the subject's behavior disrespectful. All in all, it reinforces the detective's authoritative role. 
It's important that the detective shows willingness to be transparent, that it matters to him that the subject's well informed. We note this in the following. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off by uh, going through um, what your rights are, okay? okay? Just like everybody else, okay? okay. Um, have you ever been read your rights before? No. Uh, I'm sure you've seen it on TV a whole bunch of times, right. but that's usually the American version. So okay. I'll go over with you briefly, okay? Mm -hmm. um, basically in Canada, uh, <laughs> as you know, I'm sure, is uh, we all have uh, our rights guaranteed under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, right. okay? Now, uh, Russell, just to avoid any confusion, because people do get confused when they're talked to by the police, is mm -hmm. that uh, um, you're obviously not under arrest here today, okay? Yep. Anytime you feel uh, you want to leave here, you feel free to do so. The door's not locked. Teresa will walk you down to the lobby anytime you want, okay? Mm -hmm. um, if there's anything that comes up in our interview today, Russell, that, uh, that you feel you want to talk uh, to a lawyer about, sure. um, you, just, uh, you just let me know, okay? Sure. And the reason for that is I want to explain to you exactly what's going on here, okay? Um, uh, Jessica uh, Lloyd is, um, is one of uh, four cases that we're currently investigating, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and essentially what's happened is over the past uh, uh, about four or five months, yeah. um, there have been four occurrences, that, like I said, that we're looking into. Mm. Uh, two of those occurrences occurred in September of 2009. Yeah. Um, and very briefly, they were up in the, uh, the Tweed area. Yeah. Uh, they involved uh, somebody entering uh, two different women's houses mm. um, in the evening hours and uh, committing attacks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in uh, November of 2009, yeah. uh, a young lady by the name of uh, Marie France uh, Como. Um, yeah. yeah. Jim then goes on to mention the specific names of the crimes that the perpetrator will be convicted of. On a content level, this is simply to provide the information. On a psychological level, it's done to see if the subject's triggered by these names, to see if his body language changes. Still in phase one, it's the detective's job to start intimidating the subject in a more direct fashion. And uh, so what I want to make sure you understand, and this is what we've been doing with everybody we've been talking to, is that clearly when we find out who's responsible for one or all of those crimes, yeah. uh, they could be charged with one or all of those offenses, okay? Whether it's you or whether it's anybody else, all right? Absolutely. And that's why it's important that we uh, make sure that people understand what they have to do and what they don't have to do when they're talking to us, mm. okay? This is a firm reminder a threat even, cleverly masked as wanting what's best for Russell. The masked intimidation continues. In the following, Jim almost carelessly draws attention to the fact that he's the authority and that everything's recorded. He's not careless, however. It's part of the technique. Um, is there any reason you want to call a lawyer now? No. Okay. A um, couple other uh, fairly simple and straightforward uh, things that uh, you probably understand, but uh, again, we go over them to make sure everybody's clear, mm. is that uh, you don't have to speak to me today, okay? okay? And the reason for that is because the law considers me to be what we refer to as a person of authority, mm. okay? Probably similar to what you may be considered to be on the base. Yeah. Um, and because of that, I can be compelled to appear before any judge in the country, basically, to account for what takes place here today between you and I, okay? Sure. And that's the reason why everything's recorded, yeah, um, because there can't be any more accurate record than that, right? So, no, understood. Um, you know, for the third time is being yeah. recorded, right? So, um, understood. These first two attacks uh, happened uh, not that far from my place in Tweed. Well, the second one did. Yeah. We didn't even know the first one had happened, but uh, I understand that was reasonably close as well. But the second one was uh, was very close. Yeah. So certainly at the time, the OPP did a. Uh, a door to door, and yeah. Then, uh, within a couple of days, probably the same night. So I spoke with a couple guys then. Okay, um, yeah, and I'm I'm aware of that from mm -hmm. uh, looking at the different cases, and essentially, uh, Russell. Uh, in a nutshell, that's what we wanted to uh, to talk to you about. Okay, yeah. um, those four cases are of uh, concern to us, mm -hmm. and um, you know, you've kind of uh, almost hit the nail on the head about uh, some of our issues that kind of uh, make us want to talk to to Russell Williams. Okay, because mm -hmm. um, essentially. Uh, there was a, a, a connection um, between you and, uh, and all four of those cases. Would you agree? With you hit the nail on the head, we observe calculated praise of the subject. However, the expressions put in the context of Russell having done this to himself, that he's made himself look suspicious. This way, the detective avoids using himself as the grammatical subject, avoids saying that he's suspicious of Russell. 
Russell maintains eye contact up until the point where Jim mentions the connection between Russell and the cases. Russell's looking for which words to say uh, next, and although he's and, hesitant, uh, he ends up cases. agreeing with Jim about the connection. Geographically, and then I guess I drive past. Uh, yeah. Yes, I, I would yeah. have to say there's a, a connection. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's why uh, I'll be quite frank with you. That's why uh, things kind of um, uh, evolved when uh, the officers talked to you on Thursday night. Okay. Uh, we kind of went from there because uh, when I think you discussed with them the fact that you were a. Uh, uh, a colonel yeah. uh, at the base. Um, oh, I was in uniform at the time, so. Yeah, yeah. so pretty obvious, right? Yeah. Um, so essentially, uh, then the connection with Miss Como um, yeah. was made, um, and I believe you're uh, a door or two down from one of those two uh, incidents uh, I think, in Tweed. Uh, three doors down, yeah. Yeah. Very close, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So uh, those are some of the issues we wanted to discuss with you. Yeah. Okay. Next, phase two is initiated. This is where the detective mentions specifics about the crimes and victims. Okay. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to walk you through November, but I'm going to take you to a date that's probably pretty fresh in your mind, uh, uh, the day that, uh, that Marie Franz uh, coma. Yeah. Um, do you remember how you found out? Jim asked a short question, but rather than giving a short answer, Russell gives a prolonged answer. He repeats some of the same information, adds new information to the question, makes significant pauses and uses interjections as hesitation markers. Overall, he complicates an uncomplicated question. Unwillingly, he shows that the question's problematic for him, even though it shouldn't be. I do. Yeah, I was sent an email. Um, well, as soon as the, uh, the off staff and the base learned, they told me. Okay. So I got an email, I can't remember if it was late at night, early in the morning, it was certainly, I saw it, uh, I want to say first thing in the morning, because I had just come back from Ottawa. I was in Ottawa for um, um, a set of meetings on one of the days, I can't remember what, what day of the week we're talking about, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, obviously when your people get killed, it uh, gets your attention. So. Absolutely. Yeah. This is Russell fighting with himself. And cleverly, Jim keeps quiet and lets it happen. I very much remember that coming in. And how did you know Marie Franz Coma? I'd only met her once. Um, she was on a crew uh, I was on uh, just after I got to the base. Okay. So uh, I can't even remember. I think it was a one day trip. Uh, I did a, a number of trips uh, in Canada transporting um, our um, you know, troops, sort of first leg out of Edmonton. Uh, you know, we tend to hopscotch them across uh, until they get in the theater. So, uh, anyway, I, I can't remember which trip it was, but uh, we did a number of them out to Edmonton just to, to pick up the troops, bring them to Trenton, and then uh, put a fresh crew on, and because uh, we'd fly out and back in the same day, so pushing the edge of that, and uh, fresh crew on, and then continue on after a couple hour delay. Okay. Do you know uh, roughly when that happened? That we were on the same crew. The time you met her, the one time there, yeah. It was soon after I got to the base, so uh, I, I don't remember exactly, but I would say in the first couple of months, so August, September. Okay. Yeah. Jim asked how Russell knew Marie France, but Russell makes a verb switch. Instead of no, he says met, and thus answers a slightly different question. Starting with, I'd only met her once. It's a self-protective strategy, indicating that apparently, Russell's very much self-aware of how he answers this particular question. Furthermore, it's worth noting that he details the trip. He doesn't give details about Marie France. Talking about the trip buys him more time to think, and is obviously more comfortable for him. In interrogations, guilty subjects will often elaborate on so-called safe points, points that are more or less irrelevant, but that help them calm down. We also start noticing a pattern. Russell's good at remembering details about irrelevant things, but he's seemingly bad at remembering dates with relevance to what he's being questioned about. As a detective, you shouldn't treat this as a coincidence. In the following, Russell makes substantial pauses, showing that he's especially careful about how he deals with questions with an incriminating potential. He also uses hedging language. Hitches give leeway to subjects, 
if later on they wish to modify or change the statements. Hedges express equivocation. Equivocation should always be noted by the detective. Um, now, you got that email notifying you that something had happened. Yeah. Uh, do you have uh, any kind of a, a clear recollection as to how your schedule was going that week? Well, I can't remember what, again, what day that uh, the message came in. Just a second. Um, no, I can't remember what day, day of the week, but I, um, I'm just thinking there was a whole bunch of activity uh, spun up as a result, obviously. No, I can't remember the day of the week. Um, I'm just trying to think through the news reports I read. No, I'm sorry, I can't remember what day that was, but... Uh... If Russell can remember, he can remember. There's nothing to apologize for unless there's something he's not telling. This is a clear-cut example of why unmotivated apologies in these situations should always be noted as a sign of guilty knowledge. What, I, what we learned after the fact was that the, um, the MPs had learnt uh, of her death, I think quite a bit after her body had been discovered. Okay. Russell makes a noteworthy pronoun switch from I to we. What, I, what we learned after the fact was that the... Um... This way, he depersonalizes the information, appealing to a collective we instead. This is distancing language. The hesitation and hitching continue. So, I think what happened. No, I'm sorry, just a second. Okay. So, I think, if I remember correctly, the MPs learned late that evening. I can't remember when, obviously, her, her body was discovered. It was probably in the news reports, but. Uh, so they learned, and then they passed it to ops that they meet, so they immediately passed it to me. Okay. The MPs work for the wing operations officer, so they go you know, through their chain of command, and then as soon as the, uh, the duty watch officer had that information, she advised me. Okay. Um, so again, that, that along particular with, along week... with some others. Right, right. I'm sure it spread like wildfire. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, In semantic terms, he makes the MPs the agents, while he makes himself the recipient. The MPs actively give this information to the implied passive Russell. He keeps dragging out his answers. So that particular week, uh, do you have any recollection? Well, for instance, when you got the email, uh, yeah. do you remember where you were? I was at home in Tweed. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you remember if that was a week that you were um, reasonably stable in Trenton, or had you flown? No, I had been in Ottawa. I had been in Ottawa earlier in the week. Uh, for some meetings over in uh, in Gatineau, for one of the um, it's actually for the C seventeen acquisition, I was project director and when I was here in Ottawa for that, so just some follow up stuff for that. Okay. So I had been here um, at some point in that week again. I can't remember how the days all fell together, but um, I seem to remember that I got this word shortly after having come back from Ottawa. I Seems to me it was the same week. The next passage revealing. Notice Russell's serious attempt at humor. So if we were to, uh, to you know, do a, a similar uh, investigation in your background, is there, is there anything you can think of that anybody may have misinterpreted or anything uh, in your history that somebody might say Russell Williams uh, Absolutely. did this? No. Okay. Be very boring. What's that? It'll be very boring. <laughs> All right, because essentially that's what I'm looking at, is it, uh, um... Russell indicates that his life's boring. Self-critique in a situation like this is noted. It doesn't matter if it's said jokingly. It's almost exclusively used for self-protective and thus self-serving reasons. What's more interesting, though, is the lack of alignment between the detective's laugh and Russell's facial expression. In a conversation between two speakers or more, a high level of mirroring is expected.
If one person laughs, the other person laughs, or at least smiles. (laughs) Russell doesn't. He's no longer smiling as he was in the beginning. Uh, You ever been interviewed by the police in in a room like this before? I have never been interviewed like this. Oh, no? Okay. Something's changed in the conversation. Again, this isn't the detective's doing. He's merely asking questions. By not reacting accordingly, Russell points to this perceived change himself. Jim continues masking his suspicions as flattery. Uh, you seem like a very intelligent person, and I think you can see how um, a surprise like that would uh, certainly set off some alarm bells in an investigation, right? Okay. Yeah. Can I assume you're going to be discreet? It's possible, yeah. Because uh, you know, this would have a very significant impact on the base if they thought you thought I did this. Well, uh, bottom line, Russell, that's one of the reasons we're here on a Sunday afternoon. Okay. Um, uh, the uh, the military certainly be of great assistance for, to us, especially mm-hmm. in relation to Ms. Como's investigation. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's certainly one of the things that went into our decision to, to give you a call at home today and see if we could deal with this today. Okay. So, okay. Um, it's tough to undo the rumor mill once it gets started. Russell says, if they thought you thought I did this. We know the last words, I did this. He's relating himself to the crimes, and he doesn't deny the detective's suspicions. This isn't the language of an innocent person. Now that you've had some time to, I mean, I know we've been throwing a lot of things at you here, but now you've had some time to, to think about things. Um, is there anything uh, that you're concerned about uh, that buckle swab matching in any of those four residences. Um, is there, I guess, let me explain you what I'm getting at here, Russell, okay? Um, this is a significant investigation, as you can, yep, as you can well imagine. Yep. Um, that, uh, that DNA is going to be uh, significant in our investigation, both, uh, you know, quite possibly to help you, quite possibly to help yep. us. Understood. I don't know yet. I don't know what the result is yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll go back to the example I gave you because it's a very similar uh, issue, I think. Um, and you talked about the idea of discretion here. Okay, mm-hmm. uh, you talked about the idea that uh, um, you know. You, well, I think hopefully you appreciate the fact of how we approached you here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and essentially, uh, we have no issues with that. Okay, um, we we talked recently about you know the whole idea of any unusual back to your history. Mm-hmm. Um, but another thing that can often happen in cases like this is that people um, become concerned about uh, um, things like extramarital affairs, mm-hmm. uh, indiscretions along those lines. Mm-hmm. Um, is there any contact that you may have had with any of those four women um, that you may not want your wife to be aware of? Anything like that that we should know about to try and uh, explain why if if your DNA is found it would help us understand why it may be there. Absolutely not. Okay. Two indicators of internal stress. One, during Jim's lengthy question, we notice Russell moving around in his chair. Something about this question makes him change his posture, apparently. Lengthy questions are useful for studying the subject's body language over time. Two, Russell says Absolutely not. Okay. With Absolutely a strong not. exhalation, so we know he's uncomfortable denying this. Can you think of any reason um, why we would find your DNA in any of those residences? No. Let's let's focus on. Well, for instance, uh, oops, I believe. Let me just check the name there. Make sure I've got the right address. I'm talking about the house that was just uh, a couple of doors down from you there in uh, in Tweed. A couple um, of doors down was yeah. Lori. I don't know her last name. But I don't know. Mazzucati. I don't even know what her last name is, but uh, there's a, the, the woman down the road, three doors down, was, yep. her name is Lori, I don't know her last name. All right, let me just make sure we're on the same page here. Okay. Uh, my understanding is she lived at the 76 Cozy Cove, yeah, so she would be the one, the second one, uh, the second incident on your, on your road there. Yep. Notice how Russell answers the next question. Couple of doors down. Ever been in her house? 
No. We met her once, I think the first summer um, we were there, so in 04. Okay. There's a four second pause preceding his negation. Being inside someone's house is something most people have a clear recollection of. Therefore, they are expected to answer immediately. He then again switches to the collective pronoun we. This time, it has an associating function, referring to Russell and his wife. This way, Russell's not alone, linguistically speaking. Next, Jim continues to intimidate Russell. And that's what I'm getting at. I, I, again, this is a credibility issue, right? Yeah. Because I don't want to come and see you two weeks from now and say, you know, Russ, uh, yeah. our CSI people in that house. And uh, are you familiar with how C, uh, DNA works? I think broadly, yes. I okay. guess so. um, one of the challenges we have in 2010 with DNA is it's become so uh, precise that um, I guess the best way to explain it is I can think back 15 years ago when I started in uh, for us to get a DNA match the sample we had to find was um, you know probably would have filled half of one of these cups you know because they destroy so much of the uh, the sample in the, in the testing okay. um, essentially DNA has become more and more precise to the point where when you and I walked in this room earlier today mm -hmm. uh, we could have sat down talked for 30 seconds yeah. walked out CSI officer could have come in three, four days from now, yeah. did some swabs here, and he would have found your DNA and my DNA, mm -hmm. and probably a lot of other people's DNA. Sure. Um, a little bit gross to think about, but essentially, uh, you know, as we talk, um, we, you know, a little bit of aspirate comes out of our mouth yeah. no, that uh, that contains our DNA, our blood, or, uh, our skin cells contain our DNA, yeah. and that's what I'm getting at. If you were ever in Lori's residence, uh -huh. quite possibly, quite innocently, your DNA could be uh, in that residence. Has there ever been a time you've been in there? No. Okay. It's interesting to note the change in Russell's verbal behavior. Previously, we observed a four-second pause before he said no. Now that the pressure intensifies, he's making assertive negations about not having been in Laurie's house. If you were ever in Laurie's residence, quite possibly, quite innocently, your DNA could be uh, in that residence. Has there ever been a time you've been in there? No. Okay. Um, what about the other lady down the road on uh I hadn't even heard that name so no I don't I don't actually know who that was okay have you ever v visited uh, uh, Marie Franz Como at her residence no okay all right um, so you're quite positive there would be no reason why your DNA would be in any Absolutely. of those three locations okay as a dependent word the adverb actually is used to compare two opposing thoughts here it can mean that Russell contrasts his claim to the detective's questions or, as is more often the case when dealing with a guilty subject, that he compares not knowing her to in fact knowing her. Either way, the adverbs noted. Also, we again note the speed with which Russell's now able to deny having been in any of the victim's houses. This is an observable change directly related to the pressure intensity of Jim's questions. Um, did you know Jessica Lloyd even in passing for any reason? No, I didn't hear, hear her name until it was on the news. Russell lies about not knowing Jessica. We hear a smacking sound before a micro no, I didn't hear before he says no. It was on the, news. the smacking sound suggests that his mouth is dry, which in many situations point to lying. The micro pause gives him additional time to think. The shortened no. foreshadows further explanation. And we get this explanation in form of an overemphasis that he didn't hear no, her name hear until it was, on the, it was news. on the news. But before he completes this sentence, he makes a self-repair. No, I didn't hear, hear her name until it was on the news. The meanings of self-repairs depend on the context. Here, we observe it in a denial after we've made the observation about the change in Russell's body language. So, the self-repair is very likely associated with his internal stress. Next, Jim talks about Russell but he disguises it as if he's speaking generally. He even mentions the word nervous, which is what he's probably observed about Russell's behavior at this point. Between the lines, Jim lets Russell know that it's time to start telling the truth, presupposing that he hasn't told the truth. Okay. And the reason I'm asking that uh, is because 
I know you were asked that question on Thursday night, and sometimes what we find, and again, this is one of those situations that can sometimes cause us to get in a lengthy investigation as somebody that mm -hmm. maybe doesn't deserve it. Mm -hmm. uh, but what, what can happen sometimes is they, you know, somebody gets stopped by the police like you did, and they, uh, they get asked that question, and people, when they're stopped by the police, they can be nervous, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so they blurt out an answer, and then they start driving away, and they go, oh, why did I do that? Because the problem is, is that once they uh, get asked again, then they feel compelled to maintain that answer for fear that if they change their answer, yeah. somebody could find it. You understand what I'm saying? I do. Okay. So I want to make sure that's not happening here. I don't care what you said to the officers on Thursday night no. last week. Um, if there's any uh, communication or contact between you and Jessica Lloyd, you've seen her picture, right, around town? Yeah, yeah okay. absolutely. Ever seen her before? I don't know. I would say I have not. Okay. All right. Russell's modification is interesting. He was asked if he'd ever seen her before, and he answers, I don't know. I would say I have not. Okay. He doesn't simply say, no, I haven't. He says, would say, which is a weak denial, opening for the possibility that he has in fact seen her before. Once again, this is equivocation. He says, have not, without contraction. It's understood that absence of contraction in a denial further weakens it as it's overly convincing. Next, when Russell's asked about the tires on his Pathfinder, his body language indicates that he's getting more and more uncomfortable. Okay. What kind of tires do you have on your Pathfinder? I think, um, I think they're Toyo. Okay. Do you know the brand name, or sorry, the uh, I think make? Is, uh, um, I don't know. Sorry, the, the make is Toyo. Yeah. I don't know the model. Okay. Okay. Do you remember where uh, in Ottawa you were? Yeah, I was in Gatineau with, uh, as I said, meeting about the uh, C-17. Okay. Um, now, again, I want to be fair to you here, we're going back two months. Yeah. Um, are you sure that would have been the, uh, the day you were in Ottawa? Well, only because I wasn't at the base. Okay. So I... I can't remember, honestly, that that's the day I had the meeting in Ottawa, but uh, if I wasn't at the base, it was because I was here. Okay. Now, if that is the day you had a meeting in Ottawa, um, do you remember being at the base on the Monday, uh, the 23rd, and swiping your card in and out? Do you remember what you would have done that evening to, to, to get to Ottawa for that meeting? Like, would it be... Uh... I drove to Ottawa in the morning of the day of my meeting, so if it was the Tuesday, then I would have left... Uh, Tweed. It was a very foggy morning okay. uh, that morning. Next, phase three of the interrogation sets in. This is the part where the detective reveals the additional knowledge he's had this entire time. Knowledge that the subject's most often unaware of. Has there been a time in the recent uh, one or two weeks that uh, your vehicle has uh, left that road for any reason whatsoever? Have you driven into a field with your vehicle at all um, for any reason you can think of? No. Okay. Because um, I want you to rack your brain here. This is important. So yeah, yeah. Is there anything you can remember doing that, uh, you know, would have caused you to, to uh, drive off the road? No. At that section of roadway. No, that's my early, uh, that's the early part of the highway, and I'm um, just head north. It's about 30 minutes from there to, uh, uh, probably 20 from there to my house. Okay. Um, would it surprise you to know that uh, when the CSI officers were uh, looking around uh, her property, uh, that they identified um, a set of tire tracks uh, to the north of her property? Um, looks as if the vehicle left the road mm -hmm. and uh, drove along the north tree line of, of uh, Jessica Lloyd's property. Okay. Okay. Um, they took, uh, they examined those tire tracks mm -hmm. and uh, they ha have contacts in the tire business. Obviously, mm -hmm. tire tracks mm -hmm. are a, a major source of uh, evidence for us. Sure. Um, shortly after um, this investigation started, they identified those tires as the same uh, tires on your Pathfinder. Really? Yeah. Okay. okay. 
This is incriminating information, and Russell's initial reaction is not to deny this, but to simply say, Really? Yeah. An innocent person is expected to have a strong emotional reaction to this, typically in form of anger. Russell's cooperative behavior is unexpected, and it continues. One of the other uh, one of the other things that they do to try and identify the type of vehicle that may have left those tires, mm -hmm. well, is they do two things. They they talk to witnesses. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, there was a, uh, a female police officer that actually drove by that location uh, that evening mm -hmm. and recalls seeing an SUV type vehicle in the field uh, to the north of Jessica Lloyd's house, uh, consistent with a, a Pathfinder. Okay, yeah. could maybe consistent with other things, but consistent with yeah. a Pathfinder. Um, and they. Uh, what they also do to try and identify the type of the vehicle is they look at uh, what they call the wheelbase width, mm -hmm. okay? Because different vehicles, different makes, models have wheelbase width. So yeah. they can take those two sets of tire tracks, measure the distance between them, yeah. okay? And determine what the, uh, the width is, sure. and then they can enter that into a vehicle database and it will spit out the types of vehicles, yeah. okay? Um, your Pathfinder's uh, wheelbase width is very, very close to the width of the, uh, of the tires. Uh, that were left in that field. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, do you have any recollection at all of being off that road? No, it was not off the road, no. Okay. All right. Russell. Um, Detectives are trained to say the subject's first name repeatedly throughout an interrogation. On a surface level, this technique establishes a relationship between the two. On a deeper level, it also establishes authority. Notice how it's not Russell mentioning Jim's name. Doctors and CEOs are also taught to say the first names of their patients and employees. Is there anything you can think of? Let's go talk about Marie Franz Como for a minute, okay? Mm -hmm. Is there any reason at all you can think of that during our investigation, obviously we're searching uh, computers, uh, uh, things like Blackberries, right? Mm -hmm. Electronic devices. Uh, looking through houses for things that are in handwriting, written notes, diaries, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm not at liberty to tell you what the content was, but is there any reason at all you can think of why Marie France Como would have specifically referenced you in some of her uh, in some of her writings? Not at all. No. No, absolutely not. Okay. In regards to body language. Russell visibly exaggerates his surprise. He then says, No, absolutely not. With a dramatized chuckle. Again, this is overemphasis, indicators of an unreliable denial. Next, Jim intimidates Russell one more time before leaving the room. Um, you have any questions for me right now? No. I'm just going to step out and see how things are going, okay? Sure. I mean, it is a Sunday, but there's probably 60, 70 people working on this file, so there's a mm -hmm. lot of things happening. Sure. Uh, so let me go out and see what's happening, and then I'll, uh, I'll come back in and uh, we'll hopefully continue, okay? okay? When Jim returns, phase four is initiated. This is the final phase where the detective shows direct evidence. Jim starts this phase by repeating his point about respect. This is a way of acknowledging the subject and letting the subject think that the detective is almost reluctant to present the evidence. This way, it anticipates and thus possibly tones down the subject's emotional reactions, letting the subject think he's still respected. Continuing positive affirmations an important technique in interrogations, especially when presenting incriminating evidence. Because as a detective, you always prefer voluntary confessions. I told you when I came in here uh, that I'm going to treat you with respect and I've asked you to do the same for me. Um, we talked about the whole idea of how we've uh, uh, approached you here, okay? Uh, the, the trying to be as discreet as possible, mm -hmm. okay? But the problem is, Russell, is every time I walk out of this room, there's another issue that comes up, okay? And it's not issues that point away from you, it's issues that point at you, okay? And I want, to, I want you to see what I mean, mm -hmm. all right? This is the footwear impression of the person who approached the rear of Jessica Lloyd's house mm -hmm. on the evening of the 28th and 29th of January, yeah. okay? All right, now I want you to keep in mind that this is slightly smaller, okay, in scale, 
Okay. Okay. All right. That's not to scale. That's the footwear is actually bigger. Okay. If you look here on the ruler, you'll see that uh, one inch is just slightly smaller than an actual inch. Okay. okay. But this is the way it prints off on the computer. Yeah. I'm going to move this over so you can see what I mean. All right. Because essentially, when you're dealing with footwear impressions, um, we have a gentleman on the OPP who's uh, basically world renowned. Uh, his name is John Norman. Mm -hmm. And essentially, with footwear impressions, uh, you're in a situation where you're you're pretty much in the area of, uh, of fingerprints, mm -hmm. okay? And essentially, what we're talking about here is, especially when you start adding in other pieces of, of uh, information that mm -hmm. uh, support uh, an investigative position, yeah. okay? This is a photocopy of the boot that uh, you took off your foot yeah. just a little while ago, okay? Yeah. Now, I'm not an expert in footwear impressions, so I rely on the experts. Footwear impressions are very much like uh, like fingerprint comparisons, okay? You take a look at this print, and again, this is one print. This mm -hmm. person walked through, there's several different prints to compare, mm -hmm. so we're going to get features off of one print to compare, features off of another print to compare. Yep. These are identical. Your vehicle drove up the side of Jessica Lloyd's house. Your boots walked to the back of Jessica Lloyd's house on the evening of the 28th and 29th of January. Okay. You want discretion. We need to have some honesty, okay? Because this is this is getting out of control really fast, Russell. Okay, really, really fast. Hmm. This is getting beyond my control. All right, I came in here a few hours ago and I called you the way I called you today because I wanted to give you the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. But you and I both know you were at Jessica Lloyd's house and I need to know why. Next, Jim continues associating with Russell, as if they both know what's going to happen. This is a technique to get the subject to realize or think that all hope is out. That's, uh, well, you need to explain it, because this is the other problem we're having, Russell, okay? Again, these decisions are made by me. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's a search warrant being executed at your residence in Ottawa. Okay. So your wife now knows what's going on. There's a search warrant being executed at the, your residence in Tweed, and your vehicle's been seized, okay? You and I both know they're going to find evidence that links you to these situations, okay? You and I both know that the unknown offender, male, A, on Marie France Como's body, is going to be matched to you, quite possibly before the evening's over. Okay. This is a major investigation. The Center of Forensic Sciences is on call 24 hours a day helping us with this. Mm -hmm. Your opportunity to take some control here and to have some explanation that anybody is going to believe is quickly expiring. Mm -hmm. Once more, we noticed the positive affirmation during the delivery of incriminating evidence that there's still a limited amount of time for Russell to take some control. The point about controls, almost identical to the positive affirmation technique used in the interrogation of Jody Arias. The reason that I wanted to talk with you this morning, let me say this, it's, it's obvious to me that, you know, you're not, um, uh, you're not our typical suspect. You know, you, you come from a, um, a good home, a good family. 
your parents obviously care about you um, that was evident you know when they talked to him yesterday um, and you're a bright girl um, and I'm hoping because you come from a good family and because you have a you know a decent background I'm hoping that you'll be smart about things and make some choices for yourself to help better your situation when this hits the news um, and, and it will it'll go to the media do you want to be portrayed as that cold-blooded cold-hearted murderer because it, the media loves that or do you want to be portrayed as a person that didn't didn't mean to have any of this happen it just got out of hand and you're remorseful you know which which way do you want to go how do you want to portray yourself I think that you know the reason you're here is I think that you should have the just at least one more shot at um, you know the opportunity to do the right thing okay we're applying the investigators now applying for a warrant to search your office All right, these aren't decisions that we can say yes or no to this is a practical steps in an investigation like this and Russell me for a second okay when that evidence comes in when that DNA match when that phone rings and somebody knocks on this door mm -hmm. your credibility is gone okay because this is how credibility works all right and I know you're an intelligent person and you probably don't need to hear this explanation but I also know your mind's racing right now okay because I've sat across a lot of people in your position over the years mm -hmm. okay the bottom line is is that as soon as we get that that piece of evidence that solidifies it, mm -hmm. DNA, okay? As soon as the expert in footwear impressions, the expert in tire impressions calls and says, yes, I've examined those and they're mm -hmm. a match, mm -hmm. it's all over. Because as soon as that happens, where's your credibility? Where's your believability? You're just another, uh, and again, don't take this wrong, Okay, but you can see if you step outside this room in your mind and imagine how people are going to view you, okay, if the truth comes out after the clear evidence is presented to you. Very few people like to be viewed with suspicion and as a result be treated with contempt. This is basic human psychology. Therefore, mentioning how the subject will be viewed by other people is used as a pressure technique in interrogations. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do? Russell. You know there's only one option. What do you, what do you, what other option is there? What's the option? Well, I don't think you want the cold-blooded psychopath option. I might be wrong. Because okay, don't get me wrong, I've met guys who actually kind of enjoyed the notoriety. I don't see that in you. If I saw that in you, I wouldn't be back in here talking to you, quite frankly. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you got me fooled. I don't know. This is over. What are we going to do?
Only Russ, please. Okay. Russ, maybe maybe this would help. Can you tell me what the issue is you're struggling with? What's the issue you're struggling with? It's hard to believe this is not. Why is that? Why is it hard to believe? It's just, it's just hard to believe. So you talk about perception. My only two immediate concerns from a perception perspective are what my wife must be going through right now. Yeah. And the impact this is going to have on the Canadian forces. Where do we go? Russ, is there anything you want from me? Is there anything you want me to explain? Is there something missing that you're struggling with that I can shed some light on for you? I'm struggling with how upset my wife is right now. Phase 4 breaks Russell as he now goes on to admit what he's done. The previous phases have all led up to this point. The question remains, why did Russell Williams, an accomplished colonel, commit these crimes? And even more relevant when considering the glaring difference between his masculine profession and the hidden aspects of his personal life. Why did he commit them in this way? We know of at least one damaging experience that Russell had in an early age parental divorce. Even though divorce can't begin to explain his crimes, this particular type of divorce might have been particularly traumatic. His parents were partners with their close friends, the Sofkas, and for a long time, Russell had his last name changed to Sofka. Adjusting to a stepfather, previously known as a friend of the family, might have caused Russell to be resentful of his mother. We also know that he had to relocate many times during his formative years, which may have contributed to a sense of isolation. Other than that, little is known about Russell's upbringing. We know that he showed no affection for his victims, but was very sad when one of his cats died. 
We know about the immense difference between his macho profession and the crime details. We know he was a shy and somewhat lonely student, but also a prankster who felt entitled enough to invade other students' private sphere. In almost every aspect, Russell's a walking contradiction, and psychologists have had a hard time labeling him definitively. It's clear that Russell sought comfort in fantasy. Fantasy is an outlet for tendencies that a person can express in real life for legal and or reputational reasons. For the vast majority of people, fantasies are a harmless and sometimes necessary coping mechanism. For a minority, like Russell, they escalate to the point where they can no longer be contained in the mind, but are expressed via exaggerated covert means with huge consequences for society and other people. This isn't an automatic process, of course. It depends on the individual's neurological and psychological predispositions and also the individual's own choices. The concept of choice and hence accountability is often overlooked. Seeking help is the choice Russell should have made. Instead, he chose to keep feeding his increasingly depraved fantasy. As a result, hundreds of lives have been affected negatively by his decisions. The lives of his victims, the victims' relatives, his wives, and almost paradoxically, his own life. If a person can feel empathy for other people, it makes no sense to ask him to consider the feelings of other people. Instead, he should selfishly consider his own life and ask himself, are my impulses worth losing my life for? And if the person's looking for fame, is the fame worth it when I can't even enjoy it in prison? In a backwards kind of way, the victims always defeat the perpetrator. The perpetrator is the one who's incarcerated, isolated from the rest of the world for the rest of his life. The perpetrator always loses in the end.